Thank you, Tim. As always, appreciate you opening and setting the tone for the Spirit of God to move. And appreciate it very much. And Suzanne and Peter and Tammy, thank you for leading us in worship. Thank all of you for sharing your prayer requests and your praise reports. Praise the Lord. I have one, one thing. Uh, actually, I have a couple things I want to say before we start. First of all, I want to... Uh, Say happy birthday to John. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's good. Praise the Lord. Amen. I told Sheila, he's, he's my big brother again for six months. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My brother from another mother. Hallelujah. Praise God. Appreciate John and all he's meant to me personally as well as to the church over the years. So, Praise God. And I want to thank Sheila and, and John as well for their... Uh, helping us to get the new roof, uh, hooking us up with the people that, uh, that were doing it. I did get a call uh, yesterday, and uh, the, the two that were actually doing the coordinating for us, the, the lawyer, the, the Lee, and uh, then uh, Chris, who, was, who basically does all the inspecting and oversees all of that stuff. And then they do the negotiating with the insurance companies to get it for us. Well, they're no longer with the company, so I got a call from uh, this fellow by the name of Howard, who's the business manager, and he's going to be back. He's supposed to meet with me. I finally got a hold of him again. He's supposed to meet with me sometime this week so we can figure out how we go forward as far as the siding and everything's concerned. So you might be praying about it because my, my uh, response is going to be no out-of-pocket because that was the agreement going in. <coughs> we have a check, <coughs> excuse me, for 12-something. I don't remember exactly, 12,000-something for the siding. And then we're supposed to get another check after that's finished, which would be, I don't know, four or five grand, something like that. And uh, so we're just, uh, I'll meet with him and see how we go forward. I have no reason to suspect that they're going to throw any curveballs at me, but if they do, we'll just throw them one right back that is, uh, well, then you won't be doing the job because I'm not paying anything out of pocket. We'll get, we'll get a different contractor if we have to. I'd, I'd rather not, but we'll just see, have to see what happens. So keep that in mind when you're praying. Thank you, everybody, for bringing clothing. I mean, man, that place is packed out, so it's good. That's a good thing because there's a lot of people that have needs, and especially this, this time of the year with kids going back to school, people, when the kids go back to school, mom sometimes tries to get a part-time job or something to help out with the costs and expenses, and, and uh, people just out looking for work, trying to get them, their lives together, and this is a way to help them do that so they have some decent clothes and they can go for their interviews and, and the kids can go back to school and not feel embarrassed or ashamed or something so it's a God thing and I appreciate Yvette and uh, Debbie kind of keeping the focus on that and uh, God bless you and I know he will it's this is seed sown for everybody so whoever contributes amen God will bless you as a result of that as well but yeah, I think even more importantly is the blessing that it brings to people who maybe don't know the Lord the way we do and have the opportunity uh, amen to be blessed in the ways that we are so praise God the other thing is my phone shot craps, and uh, it finally blew up yesterday, so you're not going to be able to get a hold of me. Uh, Debbie tried to get a hold of me, and she was texting me, but her name didn't come up. I mean, it just was a number, so I said, who am I talking to? <laughs> and uh, she was a little disappointed that I didn't have her name on my phone, but I actually did. It just wouldn't bring it up, so I had to try to get it on the charger, and it wouldn't charge, and it wouldn't charge. Finally, it acted like it was taking a charge, and so I thought it was charged up enough that I could use it, and I unplugged it, turned it on, and it lit up and then went out, and it, it, it won't come back on. So you don't realize how much we use these things. I'm telling you. I was on my way to church because Sally drove separately. She had to do an errand immediately after church, and, and so I'd left my sunglasses, and I Ever since I've had cataract surgery, the sun, any bright lights just really is annoying. So I always keep the sunglasses with me when I'm driving, except for this morning. Mm -hmm. And so the sun starts trying to come out as I'm on my way, and I'm thinking, oh, boy. So I I'll decide I'll just call Sally and tell her they're laying on the kitchen counter. Just bring my sunglasses with you, except that I don't have a phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just, for, you just take it for granted, right? I mean, you always have one. And the Bluetooth thing, so I hit the, the dial, you know, on the thing to, to bring up her number and it says who are you and who are you calling and what are you doing with this car you know I mean because my phone's not there so it, the Bluetooth can't connect to it it doesn't know who I am or what I'm doing or anything else so 
And I don't understand any of that anyway. I just, if I have the phone, it just works, right? I don't have a phone, so it doesn't work. So if you need to get a hold of me, don't bother. <laughs> no, seriously, if you, need to, if you really do need to get a hold of me, call Sally. Her number is the same as mine, 371-7480. Instead of the one on mine, hers is a zero. That's the only difference in the number. So if you have to get a hold of me, you can call her. Or if you just want to call somebody, give her a call. <laughs> she's, she's not doing anything, praise the Lord. So. Anyway, thank God for that, and uh, we'll, we'll get it straightened out this week sometime. But. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but, you know, after the cataract surgery and so forth, this was a year or so ago. I'm not really reliving all that other than the fact that I was diagnosed with colored blindness. I mean, it just came out of the clear green. <laughs> I always liked science. I was never a great uh, student of it, but uh, I'd love really to understand how the earth rotates. I mean, it would totally make my day. <laughs> yes, it would. Thank you, Peter. And by the way, you weren't here last week, but my time travel joke, I came with another one, and it actually went over. I think it was just simply because they didn't want to see me whining about it, and they didn't want to listen to any more of it. So, thank you for that. Anyway, uh, I know my grandkids are planning on going to the circus. Was it next weekend or something? But anyway, Clint was telling me about the circus was coming, so they were wanting to go to the circus. I thought, uh, this is for you, Ryan, in case you don't want to go, uh, how to kill an entire circus. Go for the juggler. <laughs> See, that's the kind I like. It just really makes me just, oh, my God. Can't, can't believe he would even say that. <laughs> well, I bought a thesaurus the other day without really looking it over, and I got it home, and I realized the whole book was empty. The, the pages were all blank. And I'm telling you, there's no words that I can use to describe how mad I am. <laughs> thesaurus. Words. Okay, praise God. You're kind of working with me today a little bit. Amen. I want to start out, uh, Peter, let's, let's begin at Romans chapter 8 and read verses 1 through 10. Romans 8, 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. Good rain last night. I mean, it was noisy and kept me awake, but we kind of needed it, I think. So I don't think they said we got around two inches or something at our place. Ron was talking about three something. So it was kind of, depending on, like, usual wherever you are you might get an inch here and you might get three inches somewhere else but whatever we got it was probably a good thing because our grass is starting to turn brown and the gardens are kind of shriveling up so it's a good thing and there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh or after the senses but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, again after the senses, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the senses do mind the things of the senses, what you see and what you're hearing and feeling and so on, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Praise the Lord. Now, we're all in different places. I mean, in terms of our understanding, revelation, you know, beliefs and where we are and, and where we've come from. But this is the, this is the paradox or the, uh, the enigma that I deal with every single day. And my guess is that most of y'all do the same. Me, the flesh, body, uh, humanity, and Christ in me. It, it's hard to reconcile. It's true, we know it is, but it's just because we're dealing with both of these. Amen. Christ in me is it's my spiritual, amen, eternal reality. 
who I really am and who I will always be. Amen? Because, I, see, I, uh, I always thought God wanted to punish me when, in fact, what he wanted to do was pardon me. Over the last couple months, I got a, I may have mentioned this before, but uh, I got a postcard from an old buddy of mine uh, that I was in the Marine Corps with. In fact, we were stationed in California together, and then we were also stationed in Vietnam together. And then he and I, after we got out, we did some crazy stuff. We hitchhiked around. We ended up in Aspen, Colorado, working in bars and restaurants and stuff out there for a year or so. There in Snowmass, both. We went into California, uh, Mexico, and some other places, praise the Lord, that I'm sure there are still uh, statute of limitations I haven't run out, so I won't go into all of that. But just <laughs> praise the Lord. But anyway, he had. We haven't been around each other, talked to each other, or anything for 45 years, since the early 70s. Uh, in the 60s is when we were in the Marine Corps, we got out, and that's when we kind of were running around and doing all of our stupid stuff. But he, was, he is a good friend, was a great friend, and, uh, but we just hadn't had any contact. So he, he texted me, and you know, he actually found out my address through an obituary of my brother's. And uh, so I I sent him back a card, and he was saying, you know, they live in, he lives in Florida now with his wife, and, you know, would love to get together and talk about old times and so on and so forth. So I, I texted him back and said, yeah, it'd be great. And then we emailed a couple of times, and then I got another card from him, uh, see, 1969, there, there's a stamp, the, card, the second card that he sent me had this uh, Woodstock stamp, a 50-year anniversary of Woodstock. And he yeah. said, do you, you remember where you were? <laughs> well, I wasn't at Woodstock. I was in An Hoa, Vietnam. But it was funny anyway, I mean, because, you know, we weren't there, but would have chosen that place. But anyhow, uh, he, every time he would say, you know, let me go, get, get back with me, and uh, let's catch up on the last 45 years. And I thought, buddy, you have no idea what you're asking for. <laughs> because I was not a minister. I was not a pastor. I, was, I may have been saved. If I was, it was just simply the goodness of God. and I, Because I never noticed any real change in my life, right, at that time, back then. And uh, so I wrote him a letter. I got a card and, and uh, filled the card out, blank card, you know, and, and uh, a couple of pages of catching him up. I've been married 39 years, you know, I pastored two churches. I'm still pastoring the second one on the east side of Des Moines. Uh, how much God has blessed us and, you know, things like that. And, uh, I haven't heard from him since. <laughs> well, that was just, he would have gotten this just the first of this past week. And I'm sure he's trying to figure this stuff out because I don't know where he is either. For all I know, he might be saved, although I doubt it because the cards that he sent me are like Siddhartha. They're like these, uh, the old uh, Indian, uh, Eastern Indian uh, cards, you know, with the, you know, some type of human riding on a giant mouse or, you know, the elephant with two women next to him. I mean, anybody know what I'm talking about, Eastern Indian religions? They're filled with all sorts of... Uh, pictures, because uh, there's like thousands of gods. I mean, I studied some of this stuff years ago. That's, you know, when I was trying to find what I was here for, and, uh, you know, I just thought Christianity wasn't it, so I looked in all of these other Eastern religions and so on, philosophy, and you know, Herman Hesse, and, you know, Steppenwolf, and Man, and all these different writers and, and anyway that's where we were back in those days well that's why I suspect that he sent those cards was kind of as a reminder not that he's necessarily into it other than just it would have brought back some old memories anyway the reason I'm saying this is because how, how, how things change and yet stay the same there's a part of me that still totally relates to him and the 60s but there's another part of me that just almost, it's like, I can't believe it was real, that it really happened, that I really lived that life and that I was there, you know what I'm saying? Because things are so dramatically different. Not that I'm 
by any means perfect or not flawed or still don't do things that probably I shouldn't do, but just that it's so, my perspective is totally different. As much as I still like him, you know, and I struggle with this a little bit too, I thought, Lord, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a jerk about this, but on the other hand, I'm not ashamed of the gospel and I can't, you know, try to manipulate this friendship in a way that isn't me. You know, I can't not reveal you and still be faithful to you. So it's really, it's just brought back a lot of these ideas that I, I've taken for granted, you know, over the years. My relationship with the Lord and his goodness and his mercy and his grace when I start talking to somebody who I believe doesn't know any of that, doesn't have any of that, and yet was a really good friend of mine. So I'm, I'm, I'm praying that I'll hear back from him and we'll be able to gradually work this friendship back up in a way that's significant and yet true to today as well as what it was 45 years ago. If that means anything to you, that's just something that was on my mind. You don't really care about it, aren't interested, but for whatever reason, it's just really been on my heart for the last couple of months because I'd, I'd want to see this guy saved if he isn't. You know what I mean? It's not just, I think it's God is what I'm saying. I mean, why after 45 years would this guy find me? After not knowing anything or seeing each other or talking to each other or anything for all this time, even though we were close. I think sometimes I, I told Sally, sometimes these relationships have, not, have very little to do with the relationship. You know what I'm, do you understand what I'm saying? God had a plan. This is what I think for David. And it wasn't going to happen when we first met, but we had to meet because God knew what was going to happen. He knew at some point I was going to get saved. He knew I was going to get born again. He knew I'd be pastoring, whatever. And so we had to have that connection in order for God to meet his situation, his circumstance, even though it's 45 years later. See, time's a big deal to us, but it doesn't mean a thing to God. Eternity is what he's dealing with. So we can think, well, it's 45 years just lost time. No, it's, it's just time that God was using to prepare both of us for what he wants to do going forward. That's what I believe. Now, he may surprise me with something else, but that's, that's the point I'm coming from. So I think, you know, sometimes we forget that. We, we have relationships from years back that we don't follow up on, we don't pursue, we don't do anything. And then all of a sudden, bang, that person shows up somehow, you know, through some other deal. And... And we just think, gee, what a coincidence. No, it's never a coincidence with God. Amen. There's a purpose. There's a plan. There's a way that God wants to weave these relationships together to, you know, to reveal him. So, like I said, uh, we've come a long way from our initial revelation of Jesus as Savior. Each one of us have developed a relationship that is obviously ongoing. And so we're different places and, and different revelations. But, you know, Paul said... Not that I've arrived. And he wasn't just talking about behavior, but where we are in our understanding of God's true nature. Paul said, you know, I want to know him in the power of the resurrection. He said, not that I've arrived, but that's the thing that he's, Paul is after is this understanding, this relationship, this knowledge of Christ. Amen. Because it's the knowledge of God that sets us free, that gives us, uh, amen, all that God wants us to have. So, as far as any of us have come, and we've all come a good ways, if you look back. But there's no end to what God wants to show us. So I can think about where I was 45 years ago, and where I am now, and go, wow, that is a huge change. And yet, it's about this much, if we use a timeline of some kind, of what God really wants to do, and what he really wants to show and reveal of himself. And that's true for all of us. There's more than we can ask or think. We don't even know the questions to ask. Right. We still have a tendency to see the flaws, mm -hmm. but God sees the righteousness that we are in Christ. Amen? Amen? So let's go to John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. 
and you will not come to me that you might have life. John 6, uh, 27 through 29. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm, a while back I preached a message uh, about you thought, but I am. And I'm going to refer to that a little bit, not that I'm re-preaching that message, but just simply for the sense of uh, context here. Because in John 6, uh, 31, he, he said, the, the Jews there were saying, our fathers ate manna in the desert. And Jesus basically said, you thought Moses gave you that bread. But I am the bread of life. This is Jesus talking. He said, I am the bread of life. In John 9, 28, they, they, the Jew, these same Jews were reviling him. And they said, uh, we're Moses' disciples, the law. We're, we're disciples of the law. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for you, we don't know right? And Jesus said, you thought Moses' law was the way to God, but I am the door, and by me, if any man enter, he shall be saved. In Matthew 4, Jesus said, you thought the way to redemption or the way to acceptance is by genealogy. They said, we have Abraham to our father. And he said, but I'm the way and the truth and the life, the only way to the father. Amen? Amen. Our real relationship with God was, was broken. Amen. And our purpose of exercising dominion over this entire earth was forfeited by Adam and Eve, by our first ancestors. Amen. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. And what I'm wanting to do is get us all on the same page. As I said, we're all in different places, and there's nothing wrong with that. You're born again, you're born again. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you believe in him, you're saved. You're born again. But there's so much more that God wants us to experience and much more real that he wants to make that relationship that he wants to reveal to us. And so that's what I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to get us all to. First of all, the salvation part's done. It's the sozo, it's the completeness or the fullness of that salvation that we're really striving to uh, experience and, and, and uh, interact with God on that level. Amen. So in whom the God of his, this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now he says, in the whom the God of this world hath blinded. Now the deal was, Adam and Eve were, were to be the gods of this world. And their offspring were to be the gods of this world, to rule and reign on earth, to bring heaven to earth. Amen. But they gave that up. They gave it to Satan and made him the god of this world. That's the original. That's what happened in the very beginning. And instead of man, Satan became the god of this world. He got the dominion that was initially given to mankind. Amen. So subsequently, people became estranged from God. And his plans for them. Right? Because God doesn't have the same influence anymore. Satan's the greater influence in the earth. And so these people then felt isolated from God. They were unsure of where they stood with God. They didn't know what God wanted to do for them or through them. And they lose or lost their sense of purpose. Anybody ever feel that way? Yeah. Praise the Lord. God's purposes are eternal. And he had a plan in place since the foundation of the world. And that plan was for the restoration of mankind. For man to be restored to his original condition, God of this world. Sons of God. Right? So God, he could have just come down. I mean, he could, he could do anything. He's all powerful, right? And he could have just come and took control over the earth and, and just taken it back from Satan. But he never would because... It would have been inconsistent with his integrity or with his being, who he is. Amen? And Satan then could have accused him of being just like Satan, manipulated. 
tricking, you know? So Romans 11, 29, Peter. Stay with me because it's just going to be a little slow getting through all this. And maybe you all, some of you already know all of this, but maybe some of you don't. And that's who I'm talking to. Praise the Lord. Because it, to get to where I want to go, we got to get, we got to accept all of this. You can't just leap to the end of something and say, okay, I've got this all figured out. It's kind of like uh, algebra. That, you know, it isn't the answer that they're really looking for. I found this out. Because, you know, I told you about if I had 50 cents for every math class I'd have failed, I'd have like $7.30 now. So, and algebra is just kind of the next step from there. Algebra was never a great subject for me. I did take it multiple times. I did. I took it in high school. I took it in college. I took it in college twice, algebra and advanced algebra. But I never did figure it out. I managed to get through the classes just because I, I learned the, the kind of the expectations. In fact, my professor at uh, when I, the first year of school I went to at DMAC uh, was an ex-Marine who hated me because I had hair, I had long hair, I had a beard, I had the whole thing. This is, you know, and he thought I'd given up the, the family, you know, for, <laughs> as my granddaughter likes to say, Popo's gone feral. So, <laughs> she actually calls me grandpa, but anyhow. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So if God gave man this gift of eternal life, of being the God of this earth, or the God of this world, the representative of God, the, the, uh, to rule and reign, to have dominion, right? Then he hasn't ever taken that back. It was stolen from us by Satan, but God, his intent never changed. And that's why he had to come to restore this to its original condition, to its original purpose. Amen? So how could God enable humanity to regain a relationship with him and the authority that come with that on the earth when man had thrown it away. He threw these gifts away by his own choice. He wasn't, he, there wasn't a gun put to his head. Satan didn't threaten to kill him. He just was using trickery that, you know, you, God really, you're not, you could be like God if you would just take a bite of this apple and it's gonna open up your understanding to everything. It's like the 60s, John. Well, they weren't apples, but man, there was stuff out there that just opened you up to a whole new world. Yeah. And then after we found it, we decided, kind of like Groucho Marx said about the golf club in California that wouldn't let him be a member. He said, hey, any member, any golf club that would let me be a member, I don't want any part of. And that's kind of the way I thought about that world that we were delving in, right, John? Any one of them that want us to be part of it? I don't want any part of it. <laughs> if their standards aren't any higher than that, praise the Lord. So, restoring mankind would have been impossible if not for Christ. So, Matthew 19, verse 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. Ephesians 1 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. Uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the intent now that unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's getting us back into position, amen, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Amen. So Jesus had to come as a representative of the legal authority of the earth, man. Man's the only one that ever had any authority here. God gave, created the earth, then he created man, put man in the earth, and gave man the authority on earth. God didn't have authority here. He gave it to man. Now, he could take it any time he wanted to, but then he would be a liar and he would be untrue to himself. So his plan, his purpose from ancient times, from before the foundation of the world, was for, for him to have a family, you could say, for him to have sons and daughters, and they would live 
here on this planet instead of there. And they, but they would rule this planet just like God rules heaven. Amen? Amen. So, he had to come, Jesus had to come as a human being. He had to come as the second Adam. He had to come the same way the first Adam came that was given the authority, right, in the first place. So Jesus had to come the same way, otherwise he would have been illegal. He would have been no different than Satan. He would have been a usurper. He would have been here illegally trying to work the system. Amen? And so he comes as the second Adam, which is the firstborn of an entire new creation. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. All of this, is, it'll open some things up to us as we get further into it, but I, I want us to understand. I want everybody to understand what it is God's doing. Amen. For he hath made him to be sin for us, this is Jesus, who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, who had no righteousness. We had absolutely no righteousness of our own. We were fallen creatures. We were a part of the Adamic thing. We were, our God was Satan until we accepted Christ. Right? And so he made Jesus sin. He made him us. See, what, what I found out is it, it wasn't just Jesus that hung on that cross. I was crucified with him. That's what Paul said. Amen. Everybody that's a believer, you were crucified. You were in Christ in that crucifixion. God says we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. So it's just like the same thing I'm talking about me and this buddy of mine. I didn't know. We were just stupid 21-year-old guys in Vietnam and a little crazy and mixed up and all the rest of it and never had any idea that the relationship might have any superior motive or reason other than just happenstance of us both being in the Marine Corps and being stationed at the same place and so on and so forth. But it had, it had our, the relationship we had because of the, where we were and the, and this, the you know, Mike could tell you this. It, you develop friendships differently in, in the military, especially in combat. You find out who you can depend on in a hurry, and the others, they, you, they may be acquaintances, but you, that isn't the guy you want to be hanging out with when the crap is. <laughs> you want somebody you know you can depend on, somebody you can trust, amen? And so you develop friendships that way, and that's how our friendship developed or began in the first place and so then it just went from there because we knew we could trust each other and depend on each other that once we got back into civilian life it was a natural kind of outgrowth from that so anyway he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God God's got a plan this purpose and this plan is all the way back before any human being ever lived before there was even an earth God has this plan and he's working this plan and he has to the only way that he can make this plan work is by a substitute. But it has to be a perfect substitute because this man can't be sinful. He can't have any sin in order to reverse the curse, if you will. Amen? And so, uh, Romans 8, uh, verses 1 through 4. And again, this is where we started. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you're born again, you may get condemned from people, but God does not condemn you. I don't care what you do, how bad you screw it up, He will not condemn you. Now, it'll bring all kinds of chaos and crap into your life that you don't want, and so that's the reason that we want to avoid the negative stuff, because it messes up all of our, amen, all of our horizontal relationships. And those horizontal relationships will eventually affect your vertical relationship if you get too fouled up into them, you get depressed, you get bummed out, you just, and then you just can't make this one work either because you kind of just drift away from it. But anyway, there's that, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The reason for that is so we can continuously, if we screw up, we can come right back to God and say, hey, I blew it, I know I blew it, I'm sorry, I, I, I upset people, I've hurt this or I've done that and whatever. But I know your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy is still there. I know you still love me. Help me work through this thing. Amen? That's, that's the reason for the no condemnation. So we don't have fear to come to him when we screw up. Amen? So it's like a kid and his dad or grandparents. And, you know, they, they, they're going to screw up. We know they will because they're like us, right? So we got to correct them. But we don't want to correct them out of just anger. We want them to know that this correction is for your good. Not, I'm not wanting to hurt you. I love you. Yeah. 
My, I, I love you as much now as I did before you did that thing you shouldn't have done, right? Because it's the only way the kid can work through it, right? And that's what God does for us. We are his children. We're his offspring. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, you know all the rules and all the regulations, but it can't work for you. It could just tell you. It could, all it does is point out your flaws. All the law does is point out your inability to keep it. And so the law was righteous. I mean, if anybody could keep it, which Jesus did, it's righteous. The problem is nobody can keep it except Jesus. And so we're all unrighteous. The law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, he condemned the sin in Jesus, in the flesh of Jesus. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the senses or after our, you know, what we see here, taste, touch, and smell, and so forth. Be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In other words, we don't identify with our flesh, we identify with our spirit. So Jesus reflected God's image as Adam had originally. In the same way that Adam and Eve were meant to administer God's rule on earth, Jesus showed the authority of God while he lived on earth, right? He showed us heaven. The blind received their sight. The lame walked. The lepers are cured. Sinners are, are accepted. They're you know, he ate with the sinners and, you know, all the things. that He said, you know, you, you rail on John because he was this extreme kind of Essene, uh, you know, eating locusts and honey and never touching liquor and all the, you know, everything, all the stuff that you would think of a prophet being. He said, and you complained about him being weird because he's running around with his camel hair coat and eating locusts and, and eating honey. And he said, so then I come along and I'm eating with sinners and drinking wine. And, and he said, you say, I'm a, a lush, right? A wine bibber, a drunk, right? So how, how do we please you? Right? How do you, what do you, what is it you really want? You don't want the extreme uh, strict lifestyle, but you don't want the more casual, laid back, easy kind of lifestyle that God wants us to live, to enjoy life, eat the fat, drink the wine. Why do you suppose he had all these celebrations in the Jewish feast for the people to enjoy life? What, what's the first miracle Jesus did? He turned water into wine. Why? Well, if you've never drank wine, I don't know that I can explain it. But I'm just saying, there is a sense of relaxation and ease. I mean, come on, that's why we get into alcohol and things like that. Sometimes go too far with it, because it does take us out of the stress environment. It takes us out of the anxieties and the fears and the self-doubt and all the things that everybody has, right? For a little while, we're not that anymore, right? So that's what that's God not wanting us all to become alcoholics and drug addicts, but He's saying a little wine for the stomach is not a bad thing. You know, a little fun in life is not bad. It's what He gave us to enjoy in life. Amen. So, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh. So, in the same way of Adam and Eve. Uh, being the image of God, we were meant to be the same thing. We were supposed to be here and administer God's rule on earth. Amen? And that's what Jesus did when he healed the sick, when he cleansed the lepers. Amen? The deaf uh, could hear, the dead were raised, the good news was preached to the poor, that you don't have to stay poor, right? He rose from the dead, he conquered sin, Satan, and death. So the position and the authority that Jesus won has been transferred back to mankind through our spiritual rebirth. Everybody get that? Amen? When we get born again, we get the contract back. We get the original agreement back. That's the covenant, amen, that we have. John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, or he cannot come back and rule and reign on earth. So the believers, amen, and when you receive Christ, 
you have your relationship with God and authority on earth restored to you. That's part of the package. Amen. So because Jesus, because of him, we can live again as true sons and daughters of God with all the privileges. Amen. That are associated. Amen. With being his children. We're in a position to enter completely into relationship and agree with his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. It's God's will that every person be redeemed and rule the earth. Now we know everyone won't be, but it's not his will that they don't. Amen. It'll just be a choice that they have because we've given free choice, free will. But the will of God is that everybody is redeemed back to the family. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, uh, back into relationship. Amen. So, we rule the earth through the Spirit of Christ. And it's through us that God wants to reveal His character, His nature, His principles, His precepts, His righteousness into a visible world. Into a flesh world. A world that is filled with flesh. Amen. It's an eternal plan, as I said. It applies to our present lives on earth, and it will apply throughout eternity. Remember, listen, it was never God's intention that man would live and work in heaven. Gotcha. No, we were created for earth. Amen. Because of this, the fall of our spirits, we now separate from our bodies at death, and the redeemed will be with the Lord in heaven, right? And yet God made us a promise that when we go to heaven, we're not going to stay in heaven. We're only there for a while. Because the day is going to come when our bodies will be resurrected and rejoined with our spirits so that we can continue to rule in the new earth that God is going to create. We're made for the earth. But here's the deal. We're going to get a spiritual body, a body that is in sync, amen, that is integrated with our spirits. Perfect match. Not the enigma, not the paradox that I struggle with and you probably struggle with every day. This one's going to feel right. There's not contradiction in it. It's going to be, hmm, never felt so whole. Hmm. See, I mean, a lot of those religions that I studied, they're not unlike Christianity in the sense of what it is they're trying to accomplish. They just can't do it because they don't have a Savior. They don't have the true God. But they're all after the same thing, and that is to make us whole, to make us in sync with everything around us, to where we flow with it. Well, it's never going to happen on this planet because the planet has fallen. We can be restored, but God's going to have to create a new heaven and a new earth in order for us to operate in it perfectly as he intended from the very beginning. Praise the Lord. So, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 42 through 44, uh, Peter. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 through 44. I'm going a little slower today because I cheated Tammy out of a lot of time last week. With the kids. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. He's talking about our bodies. They're corrupt. They're physical. They're just natural bodies, right? So they are buried. They're sown, amen, uh, in corruption. Or they decay. They, they wear out. They do. They corrupt. Amen. But it's raised in incorruption. It's raised that it will never wear out. It will never die. It will be like your spirit. It's eternal. It'll never grow old. It'll never get sick. It'll never wear out. Amen. It is sown in dishonor. Well, we know we're all flawed, so it's, we're not all perfectly honorable in everything we do. So it's sown with some negatives. Our past divorces, our relationships that are broken up, our, our behaviors, our whatever it might be. Even though God's forgiven us, this thing is sown a failure to some degree. I mean, in terms of our perfection in Christ. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. Why? Because it's not a natural body anymore. It's a spiritual body. It's in sync with who we really are. It's like Jesus perfected. God is one with his humanity, right? 
So it's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Praise the Lord. Uh, verses 51 through 53. 51 through 53. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And that's talking about the resurrection or the, the rapture. Amen. Not everybody's going to die. There'll be some people alive w when the rapture takes place. Those that are dead, when he calls it sleep, he's referring to Christians. He never talks about being dead because we don't die. It's like the little girl. He said, no, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And everybody goes, ah, oh, sleeping. Come on, I've seen dead people before. He said, no, she's not dead. She's just asleep. And that's the way he refers to us and all believers. When we die, the natural death, he says, no, they're not dead. They're just asleep because I'm going to wake them up here. And when I do, they're going to have a glorified body that perfectly fits with their, with their spirit. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal, amen, must put on immortality. That's exciting. And it'll get more exciting to you the older you get. Praise the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 65, verse 17. Why do we have to have another body? If all we're going to do is be in heaven, God doesn't need a body. God's a spirit, right? Because God doesn't operate here. We operate here. He operates there. Praise the Lord. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. No bad memories. That's why there's no tears amen, in heaven. It's all good. Hallelujah. Revelation 5, verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Yes. Praise the Lord. Revelation 22, verses 4 and 5. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they shall need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Praise the Lord. To reign simply means to have dominion to administrate, to be in charge. Amen? So today, as we're just living our lives and working in this fallen world and in the future, when we live and reign with Jesus, the commission from God is identical. Nothing changes. Amen? Genesis 126, let them rule over all the earth. Our purpose is the same for eternity that it is right now. We're just not as integrated and whole as God would like us to be. Praise the Lord. So what prevents us from doing this? What prevents us from ruling and reigning right now? Because a lot of people and a lot of religion and denominations have put all that off to the future. It won't happen until after the resurrection. No, that's not what God said. We are to rule and reign right here and right now and just continue that reign all the way through eternity. Amen. I, I just think it's, it's mainly because we don't recognize or we don't accept the calling. We don't accept the authority that we've received in Christ. We don't understand it or else if we do understand it, we're just not receiving it. We're just not accepting it. Amen. We don't know our rights based on the new covenant. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. And this is all we've really been talking about for the last several years. I'm just going back to the very basics to get you to understand. I'm not trying to leapfrog life and just be some, you know, phantasm or oddity. No, this is, this is biblical. This is the way it's supposed to be. And all the things that we discuss and, and talk about what we have the authority to do and how we can do this, it all comes from this. It all comes from this truth, from this reality. And so if we don't understand the basis, you know, you're never going to understand the end result. It's, again, it goes back to the algebra thing. Unless you get the equations down, the answer is irrelevant. 
Because they're not really interested in the answer alone. They know the answer. They want to know how you got the answer. And see, that's the deal with God. He has given us all things. We got the things. The question is, have we figured out the equation? I mean, have we figured out how to develop to get to that answer? Right? We have all things. Praise, am I making sense to anybody? Are there any other math failures out there that might relate to what I'm talking about? Praise the Lord. So not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter. That's the new covenant he's talking about. Not the letter, but the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Praise the Lord. All right. We've been taught for so long about our weaknesses. We go to church. I mean, I know for years you go to church and all you hear about is how much of a screw up you are, how much of a failure you are. And you need to do this and you need to get this right. You need to get that right. Amen. We were told about how unworthy we were and that we have. All of this has gone to the place where it has gives it makes it hard for us to affirm the fact that we are a new creation. And we're not trying to become a new creation. We're not trying to work ourselves up to some position of perfection and acceptance. We are there. Yes. You're already there with your mess. Yes. Amen. That's again, that's the paradox. That's the enigma that we're all struggling with. Oh, I, I'm, I'm born again. I, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Well, then what was that little act about? I don't know. That wasn't me. Right? I mean... That's the, that's the thing that we struggle with and makes it hard for us to move into the place where we really rule and reign. Because that thing keeps rearing its ugly head and it keeps reminding us and keeps, uh, keeps our focus on it instead of our true identity. The reason for the glorified body. Because then you don't have the conflict anymore. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 and 18. I'm, I'm honestly going to try to get to some place here to make some sense out of all of this. But therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, this is from God's perspective. The only perspective that really should make any difference to us, right? And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? Well, we think it's about reconciling everybody else to God, which is, that's part of it. But the major part of it is reconciling ourselves to this reality, to this truth. Because I can't reconcile somebody else if I don't know that I'm reconciled. How am I going to help them if I'm as big a screw up as they are? Okay, so that's what, he, that's, that's what he's talking about here. Amen. In Christ. In Christ, we are the redeemed. It's not a philosophy. It's... it's it's not just an opinion. It's God's description of who we are in the Son, in the second Adam who redeemed us. That's our identity. Praise the Lord. You thought manna came from Moses to give you life. But your fathers are dead in the wilderness, he said. I am. This is Jesus. I am the true bread from heaven. You thought keeping the law of Moses gave you access to God. But he said, I am, I am the fulfillment of the law. And no one comes to the Father but by me. You thought your effort and religious rituals was the door to salvation. But I am the door to the sheepfold. And anybody who enters any other way besides I am is a thief and a liar. Praise the Lord. So to use our legal authority, we have to be in Christ and use that authority, the power of Jesus' name. You know what the name of Jesus is? I am is Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Uh, remember Jesus, he said, have I been so long time with you? And you still don't know who I am? Right? That was the problem the Jews had. Not that he was a prophet. The fact that he was claiming to be God in the flesh. So how do we pray in the name of Jesus? 
we don't just, it's not just a tag that you throw on the end of something and it's like rubbing the rabbit's foot and now you get it. No, it's understanding who that name is, who, the, who is in that name. So when you use that name, understanding this is God we're talking to, it's not just by using his name. It's understanding the significance of who he really is and then appropriating his power through faith in his name. John 1.12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So remember that since Jesus won back mankind's dominion over the earth, we can now legally rule on earth again through that authority. Praise the Lord. The authority we have in his name is covenantal. It's... it's uh, it's authority based on our covenant relationship with God through Christ. Am I getting confusing here? Praise the Lord. All right. Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon Better promises. John 16, verses 23 through 27. Remember, we've been given a name. It's in our forehead. In other words, we've been sealed with this name. And in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Now, nobody's seen the Father, he said, because he's a spirit. But he's going to show us the Father. Praise the Lord. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto, thee, unto you that I will pray the Father for you. In other words, I don't need to pray for you, because you, it'll be as though I'm praying when you pray. You don't need a, a mediator now because you become the mediator, amen, or the reconciler of God's uh, creation here on earth. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Praise the Lord. Philippians 2.10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Now, remember the Lord said, I've given him a name that's above every name. What name would that be? I am. Praise the Lord. Because Christ restored us to our relationship and rights, both with God and the earth. Amen. And his name our legal authority, whether we're asking, amen, with uh, dealing with heaven, God, dealing with earth, men, or under the earth, Satan. We've got dominion. We've got authority, amen, because of this seal, because of this name that's in our forehead. See, the enemy can see it because it's a spiritual thing. We don't see it, but the devil can see it, and God sees it. That's how he distinguishes between the, the saved and the unsaved. Praise the Lord. In essence, Jesus' name is our legal authority to transact spiritual business with God. It's, it's the binder in the contract. Amen. It's the, it's the seal on the covenant. Praise the Lord. John 17, verses 18 through 26. Praise the Lord. Stay with me now. We'll get moving here. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So God sent Jesus, or God came in the flesh, right? We get born again. We become sons of God. And he says what? Now I'm sending them the same way you sent me. They're now sons of God. And I'm sending them to do the same thing you sent me to do. Praise the Lord. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Your word is truth, right? 
Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That would be us that come generations later. That they all may be one. This integration again, see? As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This is the purpose, that we become one, that we become integrated, that we become whole and conscious of that wholeness. Amen? That's where meditation comes in. We get all freaked out about meditation because we think, well, that's some Eastern cult. No, it, it began with the, the Word of God. They ripped it off and tried to use it and do use it, but for the wrong reasons. I can remember, I, took, I was in meditation. I tried all this stuff. The candle, you focus on the candle until you can't see the candle anymore. And all you're doing is opening your up to, yourself up to demonic influence. Because you have no, no barrier, nothing to hold it back. You're opening yourself up to spiritual influences that you don't want any part of. Praise the Lord. But we are to meditate on the Word. We're supposed to. That's what I do. Uh, Sally thinks I, I'm not, I don't like to talk to her. Well, I don't. Not kidding. <laughs> I do. But I'll sit out on the deck. And I got an old rock and roll station on. And... I'm just thinking, and God talks to me. I mean, I just begin to feel things, and I look around and I think, Lord, what you have done for me. This is you. I mean, I, I didn't do this. I couldn't have figured out how to make this happen. This was you. This is, this is just your faithfulness and your goodness to me. And, and I mean, it just it opens up communication lines that don't, normally exist because of all the other stuff that's going on. It's distracting. It's drawing us back into the flesh. But for that little while, it's like I'm not there. I'm, I just have eyes to see and ears to hear, but physically I'm, I could be anywhere and wouldn't know the difference. I, that may be weird, but that's, that's the way it is. I mean, that's how it works for me. And that's, I, I, I hear more from God in that than I do a lot of times when I'm just reading the Bible. And he'll give me things and just little stuff sometimes, but it develops into so much more if you just go, wow, okay. I believe that's you talking. It's worth writing down. It's worth quoting if, if he said it, you know, praise the Lord. Anyhow, the glory which thou gavest me, I've given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. It's this integral oneness with God that he's wanting us to experience. Amen. Okay, go on. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, will be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Praise the Lord. So, it's, it's, again, it's this one, it's what Jesus had that he wants us to experience. And that is this total unity or oneness with God. This awareness of his oneness with God. You say, well, he was Jesus. No, listen, we got born again. We got the very same thing. We got the same thing Jesus had when he was born into this world. When we got born again, we got what? We got dominion. We got authority. We got righteous. We got to be children of God. That's what we are. That's who we are. I know it's hard to, you know, capture that or, or maintain it when you're at work or when you're going through your routines, you know, because there's, everything else is trying to fight against that. It's trying to get you to not experience that or to not see it. Amen? Because of the God of this world wants to use this world to control you and to manipulate you. So what's the substance behind his name. See, first of all, you, gotta be, you need to be aware of the emphasis the Bible puts on the meaning of names. Today we name kids, and our children, grandchildren, and so on. They're, they're named because of how the name sounds or, or how it looks. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's just how we do it, in, especially here in the United States. But in Scripture, the name of somebody or the name of something usually symbolized the essence of whatever that thing was. 
nature of a human or uh, whatever it could have been. It represented the person's uh, collective attributes and characteristics, their nature, power, glory. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 41. So there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So the glory of something is its best expression of itself. When Moses asked to see the glory of God, what was he asking for? He was asking to see the, the best expression that God could give him of who he was. God said, I can't show you. Because the best expression of who he was was Jesus, and he was yet to come. Right? Right? So Moses eventually got to see Jesus, but it wasn't until a couple thousand years later on the Mount of Transfiguration. Right? Because when immediately when Peter says, oh, let's build a tabernacle for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and, and uh, God just said, shut up and hear my son. This is what this is about. It's about you seeing him for who he really is, this glorified man who has become, has returned back to the Lord. Amen? So, see, uh, a flower, take a flower, for example, in its true glory is when it's in full bloom. Amen? We've got flowers all over our place out there. Their true glory has just about passed because you're starting to see the, the leaves are shriveling and things are starting to die. But the true glory is when they're in full bloom. Everything is blooming. I mean, it's beautiful. It is like heaven on earth. I mean, it's gorgeous to see all that display. But it only lasts a little while. That glory is the true identity or the true picture of what that plant is. Amen? And so, like a lion, the true glory of a lion is when it's at its supreme strength, when it's at its greatest power, right? Uh, the sun, true glory of the sun is like 12 noon. It's brightest, it's hottest, it's, you know, that's the, that's the fullest e expression of, of the sun, right? So the glory of a thing is when it's at its full true self. Praise the Lord. See, listen to what I'm saying now. God wants his glory to be seen through us. But until we find that full true expression of ourselves, which is being one with him, the glory doesn't get revealed. Here's the beautiful part about this, though. When the, when the kingdom of this Satan, the world, is getting darker and darker and darker. And he said, my glory is going to fill the earth. That tells me there's going to be a people here on this planet who become integrated, who become whole. And the glory begins to flow from them. Praise the Lord. You know, God had Adam name Eve. In fact, he named her twice. First time he, he named her woman from man. Then he names her again, and he names her Eve. And the word Eve, in, in, in 2.23, Genesis 2.23, he names, he, he names her woman. Then in Genesis 3.20, he calls her Eve. He names her Eve, and that is the Hebrew word for Chava, and it means life giver. The, the essence of Eve's nature, the glory of Eve, was that she was the mother of all mankind. That was the fullness, that was the oneness of what she was to be, Right? That was her glory, amen. Abram, the word Abram means high father. God changes his name to Abraham and says you're a father of multitudes. You'll, your true glory won't be seen until all of these multitudes, amen. Jacob, he was, Jacob meant supplanter or th cheat, liar. God named him Israel. And that name means to, he will rule with God or rule as God or Prince of God. Praise the Lord. See, the, the purpose is the same for everybody, you know, under every covenant. It's just that it, it opens up under the new covenant more than it did under any other covenant, under the old covenant. Amen. Jesus changed Simon's name to uh, uh, let's see, Simon. He changes Simon's name to uh, Cephas. Amen. Which comes... Safest means, uh, Simon means to hear. It means hear. Safest means rock or stone. So he changed his name from somebody who's just a bystander. 
for somebody who's just a hearer. You know, be, a, be not a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. Yeah. He's not just a hearer because then he, he speaks out of what he's heard from the Father, from God. And he says, well, you're the rock. Or, or you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Now his hearing is more than hearing. It's, it's now revelation and it's declaration. Amen. And Jesus says, and now shalt be called the rock. Safest, the rock, or in English, Peter. Praise the Lord. Because what? Because you, for a moment, you were what you were supposed to be. You were complete. You understood your purpose. Amen? So, why, why is it that God puts such emphasis on people's names? I'll tell you why. Because mankind is made in God's image. And God places this extreme significance on his own name. Praise God. God's name symbolizes the essence of his nature. It represents his collective attributes and, and characteristics, his nature, his power, his glory. And the glory given to Jesus is given to us. A name. I am. Remember, since there is total consistency between who God is and what he says and does. He's got complete integrity or wholeness, which is the definition of holiness. And that's what he's giving us. That's what he's trying to get us to understand and to experience and to walk out in our lives. Amen? What do you suppose the main reason is we're told not to use the name of God in vain? His name doesn't just represent who he is, but it is who he is. Praise the Lord. To use his name in vain is to demean or to diminish who he is and what he is. Amen. We've got names. Our names don't mean sick him. I mean, there's just a name. It's just what we call each other. It's how we find somebody in the phone book. But they have no real spiritual power. Or few of them do. I mean, some of the uh, some that come from Hebraic uh, names do, like Nathan or David or uh, John. Some of those names you can follow. You can find them back. But how many of us live out that reality? You see, Exodus three uh, thirteen through fifteen. So if you know that you have a name, and that name is who you really are, then it would be to our benefit to, to understand that so that we can live out that name. Because God gave us that name. He renamed us. When you got born again, you got a new name. Your father named you. You got a name from the natural, from your natural parents, but it don't mean anything because it's just a name. It's just who you're called by. But the name that God has given you completes you. It makes you whole. It makes you one with him. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they'll say to me, What's his name? What am I supposed to tell them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Praise the Lord. So in other words, God's saying, I am my name. Whatever I am, that's what I'm called. <laughs> Wish you could see the expression on your face right now. <laughs> let, me, let me translate this, in, this concept into English. It goes something like this. My name is whatever I am at the time I am it. Remember, we used to have a, uh, a picture up here. It's back still, I think, back in my office. But it had all the names of God. Mm -hmm. Why all the names of God? Because whatever you need, what is the name that you would call on? Well, that, you know, I'm the God, your provider. I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm yeah. Jehovah Shalom, the God, your peace. I'm Jehovah Sidkenu, the God, your righteousness. We've been given all of that. And he tells us that all of those names are symbolized or, or centralized in I am. 
Because I am whatever one of those things is you need. That's what you're calling on I am for. If you need healing, I'm calling on the healer. Amen. I'm calling on the one whose stripes, by whose stripes I was healed. Right? If I need provision, I'm calling on the one who came, amen, to provide for all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Whatever the need is, that's the God that I'm calling on. It's only one God, but he has all of these names that are encapsulated in the one name, I am. And then he calls Jesus, Jesus, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is our all-sufficiency, and his name differs depending on what our need is at any particular time. God's saying, if you need bread, then pray, Father, you are my bread. You are the manna, the true bread that come down from heaven, right? That's what Jesus was trying to explain to these people. Amen. When you acknowledge that I'm your provider and sustenance, then I become bread to you. Praise the Lord. If you're thirsty, pray, Father, you're my water. Jesus was that rock from which the water flowed. And he even tells us, hey, believe on me. You'll never thirst again because out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. You can be I am. You can have whatever your need might be. Praise the Lord. In other words, he's saying, I manifest the characteristic of whatever you need. Whatever you need is what I'll be. Praise God. See, here's the deal. Neither of Jesus' earthly parents named him. Amen. Because his name had already been given him by God, his heavenly father. And why did God name Jesus? Because first of all, Jesus was his offspring. And secondly, because Jesus' name had to reflect who he was. Savior. Emmanuel, God with us. He'll save his people from their sins. Praise the Lord. So Jesus is the name of Christ in his humanity. You got that. That's why God gave him that name. Because he was going to be in, in human form. Amen. As the son of man. But I am is the name of Christ in his divinity. He said before Abraham was born, I am. So I'm looking at... Ron and Yvette, Darlene, Sheila, Suzanne. I mean, all the names I could go through, right? Rita. That's your earthly name. That's the name that you go by in the natural realm. But that's not your true name. That's just your physical name. You have a spiritual name. And that name is I Am. It was given to you by your father. And that's why Jesus is always trying to work this kind of juxtaposition of you think I'm Jesus you think I'm Mary and Joseph's son but I am he had total integration total integrity with God he was totally one with God and that's what he's trying to get us to do that's what he's trying to get us to believe because out of that belief will flow all that God is all that you are in reality see we're we're satisfied with Nathan. That name's good. That's what the heck, you know. But it's not the name that God sees when he looks at me. He sees the name that he gave me. That's on my heavenly birth certificate. I am. Praise the Lord. I am the bread of life. I am a rock that you drank from, the water from heaven that will never thirst again. Come to me and drink. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life, the access to God. I am the true vine that produces spiritual fruit. The bottom line is that you thought that God would punish when all he wanted to do was pardon. You want God to meet your need when you pray in Jesus' name. Then pray based on the divine nature. Amen. That that, that meets that need or that, that uh, uh, will satisfy whatever that need is. 
instead of just hanging it out there in Jesus' name, pray with the understanding of who I'm praying to is the source of whatever I need. If it's money, if it's, if it's relationship restored, if it's, if it's food, if it's water, if it's clothing, whatever it is. If it's healing, deliverance, amen. Pray with that understanding. You're praying in Jesus' name every time you open your mouth if you're a Christian. Right? But it's not the earthly name. It, it was just a way of identifying the Father in the earth. And that's the same way with us. We're supposed to be this reflection of I am. Not the best Ron you can be. Not the best Nathan you can be because it'll never be enough. It's the I am that has all the answers, that has all the solutions. Amen? Pray based on that divine nature. Not just calling on Jesus or saying Jesus, but by calling on His nature, His attributes, that can meet every one of your needs. I am. So according to the Word of God, I'm wrapping up here. Jesus is the only one that can speak for us. He is the mediator between man and God. Amen? But we became I am. Jesus in the natural, I am in the spirit. Right? And because of that, I can come boldly to the throne of grace. I don't need a mediator anymore. I have already had a mediator, and everything's been made right between me and God. Praise the Lord. We've been given that new name. Philippians 2, 9 through 10. Or 9 and 10. Philippians 2, 9 and 10. At the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. It's not Jesus. Jesus was an earthly name for a spiritual being or for a spirit-filled being. Amen. The name that's above every name is I Am. Praise the Lord. God said the only thing he exalted above his name was his word. Praise God. So, has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. Praise God. If you want the knee of poverty to bow, you have to use the right name. Praise the Lord. He came, amen, and did what? He preached good news to the poor. The good news to the poor would be you don't have to be poor anymore. Right? So if I'm... If I need, praise God, if I'm struggling financially, I'm going to pray to the God, amen, of resource. To the God who supplies all of my needs according to his riches in glory. To the one who, amen, uh, preached good news to the poor. Am I making sense? I'm not, this, see, this isn't about what I say in a name. It's about what I understand when I pray. See, we've made it about semantics. That isn't really what God's saying. He isn't saying put a tag on the end of every prayer that says in Jesus' name. He's saying, no, know who it is you're praying to and what it is you're praying for, and then pray to that end. Pray to the God that healeth thee. He sent his word and healed me and delivered me from destruction. I'm not just, it's not just a crapshoot that in the name of Jesus. No, he gave him a name that's above the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus was for us to be able to identify with him as Savior and God in the flesh. But he gave him a name that was above all that, which is I am. Because all power and authority was given to him. To who? I am. Who else are you going to give it to? Praise God. If, if the knee of sickness is to bow, don't use somebody else's name. If you want the knee of fear or depression to go, use the name of Jesus that defines that. His name is also the Word of God. Where you go, you find where God said, I'll do this, and that's what you pray. Matthew 28, 18 through 19, or it'll be the last scripture. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. And that's what he's talking about here when he says, All power has been given unto me. Why? Because I've been given a name that's above every name. 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What's the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? We say, Jesus, but it's I am. <laughs> They're all one God. I and my Father are one. The Holy Spirit comes out from him. But they're, they're, they're manifestations, but they're just one God. Just think of it as us. We are all just manifestations of the one true God. We're different, but we're all the same. Right? Go ye therefore. Amen. I am. Baptized. I am. Praise the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Whatever you need, call on him to fulfill that need based on who he is. Not just on a name, but on what that name represents. Who he is and who you are. And use what he's given you, which is his divine nature. The authority to use his name to manifest his power in your life and others. The name of the Lord Jesus, I am. Praise the Lord. There is so much that God wants us to understand about this, this oneness, this unity. I mean, I, we used to think, it's, we knew, thought it was one thing, amen. But it's everything. The oneness of God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, is the same thing that he's trying to show us that we have to come to this understanding and this revelation of. Amen? Jesus, the man. Nathan, the man. Right? But my heavenly Father has come to dwell in me by the Holy Spirit. When I recognize that, I, I become integrated. When I focus on that, I become integrated. Then I can ask whatsoever I will, and he'll do it. Because I'm asking in Jesus' name. Am I making sense? I'm, you're not asking in Jesus' name because you say Jesus. You're asking in Jesus' name because you are integrated, because you are whole, because you are one. As he is in the Father, I am in him. We are one in the Father. I hope I'm making some kind of sense. But it's, that's, what we're, that's what we're after. It isn't about another religious hoop to jump through. It's about coming into the fullness of who we are. If you need to meditate on something, meditate on this. When you've got time, when you've got to think about this oneness that you have with God. And out of that oneness, you can ask whatsoever you will because you're asking in the name of Jesus or you're asking in the I am when you do it. When we're fractured, our prayers are fractured. When we're praying from some uh, place of failure and weakness and sorrow or fear, that's not, that's not a God prayer. That's, that's a pity prayer. That's a fear prayer. It's when we become one, when we are integrated. We understand, I have this right, I have this authority in Christ, I'm one with Him. Then I can boldly come to the throne of grace and say, Father, You are my bread. You are my healer. You are my deliverance. I believe and I thank You for healing me. I thank You for making me whole. And then, there, I'm feeling it right now. It, it rises up in you, this sense of victory, this sense of, this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not by just waving a flag that says Jesus or by saying Jesus, but by understanding I'm one with Him. He has integrated me into God. Hallelujah. You'll get whatever you pray when you pray out of that reality. But it takes time. Because again, we're all at different places. Some are just, We're still trying to figure out the Jesus that saved me. And it's so much more than that. But we had to have that to get to the place where we could be made whole, to where we could be restored. And I, for one, don't want to have to wait until I get a resurrected body to experience this, because we don't have to. That's why he gave us all power today. Amen? Go ye therefore. Whatever comes out of your mouth in faith in God is going to be the result. It's going to be the reality you experience. Praise the Lord. So I'm, the battle that I fight is not with the devil. He's already defeated. The battle I fight is with this. The battle I fight is with dominating my thinking. You know, not allowing my behavior to, to, to dictate 
my reality to, to who I am or what I am. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, I'll give you something to think about this week. Amen. Think about who you are. Meditate on that reality. Out of you will flow God. This river of living water. That's what Jesus was talking about in all of those dialogues, all of those sometimes monologues. Whatever he was saying, he was trying to get us to this place because until some generation rises up to the fullness of the stature of Christ. In other words, somebody rises up to this wholeness, this oneness that he had, nothing's going to change. We can complain about the governments, we can complain about all that stuff, but it's not going to change until we change it. Amen? You, let me uh, close with this. Do you know why there is a dome on our capital? You ever seen a circus without one? <laughs> ever seen a circus with a flat roof? No. Nah, nah. It's filled with clowns. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm affecting you. But if, hey, you know, they'll wave the Christian banner when they're before some Christians to get their votes, but they don't care. I mean, with few exceptions, they're just out to get whatever they can get. We have to be the influence, the God influence in this land. People we vote for, things we tolerate, we let the natural world dictate to us as Christians how we're going to live, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. You've got the power. Amen? You just have to exercise it confidence. Meditate on who you are in Christ. And I believe things will change. Praise the Lord. Thank you for patiently enduring that painful experience I call the message. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Appreciate you. Have a great week. The Lord love you. See you soon. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. <laughs>